episode 24 of the Photoshop Show. Tonight, we're doing something different. This is the big event. Tonight, we're going to be criticizing one another's images. And when I say criticizing, I mean that only in the best way. Positive criticism, constructive criticism. Yes. Um, and I get to criticize Ron Clifford's photo. <laughs> How fun is that? Um, but this is a brand new idea for the, sh the Photoshop show. Um, we want to start applying some of the techniques that we've been showing you here and showing you how we um, you know, personally go about approaching images using all the wonderfulness in Lightroom and Photoshop. And so that's what we're going to be doing tonight. And not only are we going to be doing this, but you're going to be doing this too. That's and right. my co-host, Ron Clifford, is going to tell you how in just a minute. But before he does, I want to welcome the other people that you see at the bottom of the screen. Mr. Dave Bell over on our left, who's a veteran of the Photoshop show. Good evening, everyone. Great to be back. Dave Bell is a professor, isn't that right? That's right. Yes. Teach it information systems and some engineering, but... Uh, run around. My camera's always with me. So. Also a photographer, of course. And Dave is going to be monitoring our text chat room tonight. So if you do have anything that you'd like to chime in on, please text us a question and Dave will bust in and tell us what you want to know. And then on the other side is Taylor Beckley. She is a brand new initiate to the Photoshop show, although I hope she's been watching it. But this of course. Is she's appeared. And where can we find you online and what do you do? Tell us about you. So Google Plus, um, you can find me there. Um, I am really, when Ron asked me to come on the show, I was really excited. I'm, I'm still consider myself sort of a newbie to the whole post-processing, photography, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, but I've learned so much in my short amount of time here. Um, photography is how I round out my life. My, in my other world, um, I'm getting a doctorate in counseling psychology. So, <laughs> busy life right now, but uh, like Dave, I, I'm rarely seen without my camera in my bag, so um, I make my friends uncomfortable often. <laughs> you too. <laughs> yes. Well, that's terrific. Someday we'll have to talk. I went to psychology graduate school too. Long Definitely. Time. It was but really we'll fun. schedule that. Yeah. Okay, so now, Ron Clifford, yes. tell us what's going on tonight. Well... Like you were mentioning, we, we spend a lot of time showing people the things we do, but we don't ever really discuss uh, why we do them or show them a, a real workflow, working on a real image. And, and you gave me a great idea this week when you, you talked about maybe we could process each other's image. And I said, well, let's do that live online. And maybe we could turn it into fun for the viewers. And so what I thought would be a great idea, and, and, and you've come along and said, sure, this would be great. So I'm really happy was not only will we get to heckle each other while we work on each other's image and talk about more about the process of why we're doing what we're doing, uh, as well as how we're doing what we're doing. But we want to give viewers the opportunity to be able to process one of these images as well and then submit them to our event on, on the event, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, gallery. Um, and I have enabled the, uh, people to submit their images onto the event page. Um, and, um, boy, it's hard to verbalize this the first time through. Um, well, I think so we what, what are you... A contest. Can, can and, I... So we want people to, sorry. Uh, just to suggest, I think you're inviting people to go to the event page for the Photoshop show episode 24 called yes, The Big Event. That's right. And when they get, and how do they get to the event Page. Let me, I'm actually going to do a screen share to show you um, how to do that um, and exactly where to submit your, your one edited image from a choice of one of the ones Jan and I are working on tonight. And so uh, let me screen share. It always takes a second. It is hard to give instructions, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. And I do, I, I do this, but I'm, I still get lost. No, wrong one there. There. So this is Ron, the page. Jason. Ron, I think you may have Jan selected for everyone on the, I'm looking at the uh, event okay, view, just... and Jan is front and center the whole time. All right. How is that? <laughs> now we've got our infinity screen share. Okay, now I'm going to talk and it's going to show up, right? That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. 
Okay, so this is our event today. Uh, you can see that our live broadcast is here, although I'm not going to play it or you're going to see two of us. Um, at the top of the page is a big red button called Add Photos. And what we want you to do is we want you to take one of the images I'm going to give the link for during the show. We're also going to pa paste the link for it in our event um, by the end of the show or right after the end of the show, where you can download one of the two images we're working on, edit it any way you feel you want to do it, artistically, realistically, however, then submit it to this gallery here on the event page. Jan and I are going to look them over, and we're going to select a winner and maybe even a runner-up to highlight on the, Light, uh, the Photoshop and Lightroom users community and in our own streams as kind of the winner. It's a, it's a, it's all fun and camaraderie, and we want to highlight more of our process and what not just what we do, but what you guys do too, and make it um, something interactive rather than just always talking to you. We're going to work together. So I think that sounds really fun. So if I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong here. What people need to do if they want to play this game is um, they need to go to a link to Ron Clifford's public Dropbox, from yeah. which they'll be able to download the images that you see here tonight. That's and right. then you're asking that they work on one of the images, not both. Yeah. And when they've got a wonderful result, processing it in Lightroom or Photoshop or really any program that you think is appropriate, taking that result and uploading it to where? To the event to the for event. this, to the event that goes with the show. And yeah. the way you get to the event that goes with the show is in Google Plus, you go to the column on the left, and you click where it says events, correct? Yeah. And then you look for the event called the Photoshop Show 24, the big event. Yeah. And after the show, it'll be lower down in the scroll to previous events, but it'll remain there for us to be able to post to. Great. And yeah, in a nutshell, that's it. And um, through the show, I'll be taking time when there is time to, to get that link to the Dropbox up and then get the images both images there. Now you can work on both images, but we only want you to upload one finished image. So we'll see how this goes. And then in the next show in two weeks, on Tuesday, February 19th, um, we'll be announcing uh, who we think is the winner. But really, you're all winners. Uh, but you know, you have to have a winner, right? <laughs> okay. Cool. So um, why don't we go ahead and start working on a couple of images. So in advance of the show, I picked out an image that I would like Ron to work on, uh, you know, a photo that I took. I have no idea what he's going to do with it. It's totally up to him. And the way I see it, there are lots of different ways to process the same photo. You can even save a crummy photo from extinction by processing it uh, in a good way. So Ron is going to do that with a photo that I gave him that I actually think is a kind of crummy photo. <laughs> You know what? It's, it's really, it's not a bad photo. There, there's elements of this photo that really work. I'm just going to load up, um, some of you are familiar with and some of you aren't, with a, a program called ScreenLeap. And um, it's going to give you a higher resolution if you decide to watch it. I'm going to screen share here, but I'm going to uh, have Dave share a, a link in just a second into the chat to my ScreenLeap, which will be showing a high resolution version of my screen. And so from this uh, link share, you can see a high resolution um, version of what I'm about to screen share. This screen, while you're doing that, I'll say, Ron was, um, Ron introduced me to this um, program called Screen Leap. And it's really amazing because it lets you look at your images very closely and they look great. And that's because it's showing a high resolution view of your photos and it, everything looks a lot better than it does on just plain old Google Plus although we love Google Plus um, it's nice to be able to get in close to our photos particularly if you're checking focus or looking for noise and you want to see what's really happening there so yeah. that's screen leap okay and I just need to check um, with um, Dave that's that not it's not quite I posted it but you must not quite be on yet because it's saying that it doesn't exist it hasn't oh okay are, yeah, are you, it are you is through the yet? Hangout. Are you sharing it already? Yeah, it is through the Hangout. Let me just double check that. 
Yeah, just R. Clifford after the. It popped up for me. Oh, it did. Okay. Let's see. Let me try it one more time. Yeah, I see it it's moving a, it around. I have one viewing the screen. Okay, I see Lightroom now with the photo. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was the link I shared in our personal chat, Dave. R mm -hmm. underscore Clifford. Oh, there's an underscore. Sorry, that it, that was right on a line break. So, yeah, sorry, it's R right. underscore Clifford. Got it. Okay. And so, yeah, just make sure that, that the share was right. And I'll start working anyway, because you can still see the Hangout. Uh, so, Ron, so this is the you, image. Can you explain to people how they could watch the screen leap, the screen leap version um, of you working on this photo? Yes, uh, Screen Leap is just a web page. Um, it's a service provided providing high resolution screen sharing. And if you go to uh, www.screenleap.com forward slash r underscore Clifford, and you'll be able to see what I'm sharing in the Hangout in high resolution. One thing I should mention is there is a little checkbox if if my image is bigger than your screen to choose to fit to screen, you'll want to look for that so you can see my entire screen on your browser. And I'm seeing that over on the top right of my screen leap, um, uh, I don't know what to call it, page. It's, it's really a page in my web browser for screen leap. And on the top right is a menu that says actual screen size. And when you click there, you can choose fit to screen instead. Yeah, the next time we do this, I'll make sure there's good instructions for screen leap right in the event so that we know we can just point to that. You're all helping us explore something really new tonight, so, so be patient with us. Anyway, so when I'm looking at an, an image for the first time, I very rarely process somebody else's image, so this is really new to me, and it's actually uh, made me a little bit nervous, but when Jan sent this, I knew right away what I wanted to do. It reminded me immediately of those mystery books that you see, um, where it's kind of like you know, find the feather and find the, the eyedropper and find the clippers. And you know those find those mystery books you get when you have to yeah. play with your kids? Maybe you don't. But anyway, I, so I wanted to get the what's that, Dave? Where's Waldo on a but on yeah, something artistic like that. scale? These books have these yes. really cool, nostalgic looking pages in them and it's really hard to find everything. It's supposed to be hard to find things. Like it would ask you to find a dragon and find a beetle and find a thimble and find a pen and find a quill. This really reminded me of that. So I thought, what I'd like to do is give it more nostalgia. Rather than bring it back into a, a, a realistic picture, I thought uh, doing some layer texturing with layers and masks would be a great idea. So at first, I'm not even going to do anything. I've opened it in Lightroom. But the first thing I'm going to do right away is edit it in Photoshop. And to can do I that... Ask you, can I ask you a favor, Ron, in case people don't know? You see where yes. it says the name of the, the big long name of the photo and all that stuff about the photo? Do you know how to get rid of that? Like that? No. Nope. Uh, yeah, press I. Correct. It's gone what? now. There is a, a, about a three second delay on screen leap, but if you click the I, sorry about that, Jan, you can get rid of the information on the top left hand corner of the page. So I'm, I'm going to move into Photoshop. The way I'm going to do it today is to right click on my image and choose Edit In, and choose Adobe Photoshop CS5. Now I can choose Edit Smart Object. I'm, I'm rendering using Lightroom. I have to the camera, I guess. Um, I could as a projector, I can just open it straight into Photoshop. And my, my computer's chugging along because I have so many windows open. So that little, while you're chugging along, that little uh, message that we saw about you might want to have Lightroom or, or Camera Raw 7.2 or 7.3, that comes up when there's a mismatch between the version of Lightroom that you have and the version of Camera Raw that you have updated to in your Photoshop program. And recently, I guess there was an update to Camera Raw, and you must have updated your, cam your Lightroom but not your Photoshop. That's why you see That's that. That's right. And I, I actually, I've been, I've been yeah. wondering about that because I did upgrade. This is Camera Raw 6.7, and I don't know if I can have Camera Raw 7 in CS5. You cannot. That's a very uh, good point. 
And so I'm working with CS5 today and using Lightroom 4, which has Camera Raw 7. So that's and perfectly so all right. That's, that works fine, yeah. except if you did something in Lightroom uh, that's brand new, like using the HDR 32-bit new feature or some other new feature in Lightroom that had not been included in uh, the, the equivalent of Camera Raw 6.7, you would not see that in this image when you took it over to Camera Raw. Since you haven't done that, it's perfectly fine. So that explains the error message I've gotten for the past week. Okay, so I have that image, but I also have a few other images. I'm just going to pull over, and what I have down here are, are files I've already selected well ahead of time in order to load them as layers into Photoshop. So I'm just going to select those, and I'm going to open these as layers in Photoshop. And I should have had this all loaded ahead of time, really. No, I think it's interesting I, to see how to do it. Um, I could have opened them all together as layers in Photoshop, but because they're different dimensions, that would create mm. another issue I didn't want to have to deal with right away. So I'm, I'm opening them separately as layers in Photoshop for now, and then we'll do it in live in Photoshop. I'm surprised usually this is a pretty quick process on my machine. Tonight, well, if you look at the more. bottom, if you look down at the bottom left of this image, this one you have open that we're looking at is now 91 megabytes. I think that may have something to do with it. It could, yeah. Right, yeah. And and your screen leap sharing along with Hangout sharing at the same time. Slowing it down. It's a lot. Asking the computer to do a lot, I think. Yeah. I think I need to upgrade my computer. It's only <laughs> quad core with 12 gigabytes of RAM. It's enough power to put six men on the moon, but it can't run Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> you always need to upgrade a computer. When you get your new computer, it's time to upgrade your computer. <laughs> kind of looks like it's not opening them into Photoshop. Yeah, it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Oh, open anyway. Thank you, Jan. Because now that it's already loaded, they should just pop in one and like just go pop, pop, pop. There we go. So, so uh, while that's... it's loaded... That Sorry, message talk that, about. <laughs> the message you saw that said open anyway or use Lightroom, a render with Lightroom, it basically is giving you the two choices that you get when you have the mismatch between Lightroom and the Adobe Camera Raw plugin for Photoshop. In most cases, I choose render using Lightroom in order to make sure that any changes I made in Lightroom appear in the images when they do open in Photoshop. Oh, okay. It's good to know that difference. And the only reason I know this stuff, you guys, <laughs> is because I just did a whole course on going from Photoshop to Lightroom for lynda.com, and it takes hours to explain this. It's so ridiculously <laughs> complicated. It's silly. But, wow. you know, otherwise I would not have known, I promise you. Well, it's just one of the reasons we continue to hang around you. Oh, thank yeah. you. Tidbits so of information. Do? Sorry. Well, those those are loading because they're not loading for some reason as layers, but or only one of them loaded. It's I think you have to keep going back to Lightroom and clicking that open anyway jobber. Oh, really? Maybe it no. seemed to be what I saw before. Huh. Well, that's okay. I have I have a start to work with. What I'm going to do first is. Um, and I'll get one other started up here. Let's just, I'll just open it on its own. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Render using that. Now. Sometimes if I get to Photoshop, and Photoshop is so slow, if I'm starting with raw files, I will uh, reduce them to 8-bit images just because I can't stand it. Yeah. So I have a couple to start with, so I can start to talk about a bit of my process, and then I'll load a couple more. The first thing I want to do with this image is um, I want to crop it, and I, uh, it, it's got a little bit too much information for me. And I'm not going to be too concerned about the format, because what I'm thinking is it's going to be used in a, in a kind of a book with a longer format. And I, I kind of want an angle on the crop. But I want to constrain it. So now this is your image, Jan. Like. Yeah, I don't want to admit it. 
<laughs> no, it's fine. Just wanted to clarify. Oh. Wait a second. We're, play, we're playing with other people's images. Yes, yeah, so we're playing with other people's images. This is opposite of Lightroom, the crop. I should have done it in Lightroom. I'm feeling really rather silly not having done all this in Lightroom already. So when I, I took this photo, in, it's just a shop window. We were walking around in Paris and we saw this. And for me, this shop was heaven because look what it has. It has paper. It has ink. It has pens. It has doodads. It's kind of like a book art store. And oh, I love that stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring a texture over by using my move tool. So V is the, my command, gets my move tool. I press shift and it, and it maintains its aspect ratio and I'm going to hold it over my next image, bring it down and drop it. Now, it's not the same aspect ratio. Like I mentioned, this was a vertical with different pixel sizes. So to solve that, I'm going to control T, which is transform. And I'm not really concerned about losing pixel data here and making smart objects because it's just a texture layer and I'm not really changing it that much. So I'm just going to stretch it out a little bit over my image and click enter to accept it. And now that I've accepted it, I'm going to turn down the opacity a bit to see what I have. One of the first things I want to do with textures is I, I really don't want it that color. Um, one of the things I try right away is to invert it by using the command control or command I and see how it, it's the opposite color to the blue. And that's actually a little bit more along the lines of what I want. But I do want to lower the saturation. So I've just clicked up into the adjustments. I'm choosing saturation. And I'm drawing the saturation of that down a bit. Now, Jen, you can you can clarify. I usually alt click between them to make sure it only affects the layer below it. Is that right? Right. And on a PC, that's option. Uh, excuse me. On a PC, it's alt click, Mac but on the Mac, option. it's option click. Option click. Yeah. And so, just going to bring the saturation down on that a little bit, so it's not quite so warm. Yeah. Say that one more time when you you alt click or option click on the. Adjustment layer, yeah. so it, it only adjusts click, one layer below it. Yeah, it, it, oh. it kind of nails it to the layer below. See the way I just did that? Yeah. I'll do it one more time so it, it commits it to the layer below but doesn't affect your, the other layers. You know, here's another way to do that. I find people have trouble with that technique. They can't tell when to click. So if you look at the bottom of the adjustments panel, the properties panel, if you're in Photoshop CS6, there's an icon there for clipping layers together right there, exactly. And that does the same thing as right. option clicking oh. or alt clicking, yeah. See, there's, there's always more than one way, always. Yes, there is. OK, so I'm going to bring my, for whatever reason, I want to bring the, not the opacity of, <laughs> did you see what I was doing there? I was bringing the opacity of my adjustment down and not my layer. I want to bring my layer opacity down. Something just like that. And then I'm going to pick up my brush tool. And we know the, the white reveals, black conceals um, acronym that Jan has taught us so many times. I'm going to take my adjustment brush with black. And I know you don't see my circle properly. Um, apparently, it's a block for you. But I'm just going to take it away in some areas. I don't want it so heavy. So using a very low flow and maximum opacity, I'm going to kind of like spray paint. Whoops. Sorry, I have to highlight what I'm spray painting on. Highlight my mask and just lightly spray paint to take some of that effect away. Ah, switch to white again. Make sure you're using the opposite color. I'm How did you switch to now. the opposite color for people who don't know? Using the X key. Right. Now, if you look. Over, if you can see, over here on the little mask, you can see it's starting to go gray because I've used very low opacity or low flow, sorry. So it's more like I'm spray painting from a very weak can. And I'm actually spray painting this effect out. Actually, I want a little bit more flow than that. I generally, when I'm doing stuff like this, don't work with any more than 20% flow. I do want some of the texture there, though. I want less over there. Oh, I know what I did wrong. 
there we go. What I just did, sorry, Jen, I'm really, really all over the place. I was, this is actually a common mistake, so I'm going to point out what I just did. I was painting on the, the mask here that I wanted on my layer, not on my adjustment. And so what I'm doing is dragging that mask to the layer where I wanted it in the first place. And I'm actually going to take some of that out. But you know, Ron, it's really interesting to watch because what I see is the things that stump everybody um, are the thing, you know, there, and, and when I see that, like, for example, not being on the correct layer or not being on the layer mat or not having the layer mask selected or not having the layer mask on the correct layer, those things everybody bumps into all the time. So I always tell people when I'm teaching them, you know, you shouldn't feel bad about that. That really is an issue with the software. If everybody is doing the same goof up all the time, it's not the people doing it. It's the th it's the application. Do so you you're know? masking yeah. out the texture rather than the the adjustment. That's right. Too now much. I'm masking yeah. out the texture. When I had it up here, I was masking out the, the adjustment. adjustment. Okay. Yeah. And so that needs to be attached to what I'm working on. And that is such a common, common mistake. And when I'm tired, I make it all the time. And so I'm going to carry on, and I'm going to bring another uh, texture over and, and do the same thing. I'm going to choose my Move tool. The only way this works, by the way, is with the Move tool. If you don't have the Move tool se selected, you're going to fight with trying to figure out why this isn't working. Holding the Shift key, I'm going to hold, hold, go over top of the bar on top where my image is, and then drop it down on the image. And where did I drop it? I dropped it. Below the adjustment. In the wrong spot, yeah. Where, where, do you, uh, where do you find a good source for textures? Um, I photograph them myself. Everything that you're seeing me work with today, I photographed myself. This is a piece of wood from the side of my house. Oh, oh cool. Time to yeah. repaint. <laughs> yeah, the previous one that I worked on was some concrete, and then I just uh, uh, only gave it the blue channel. And so it becomes either blue or, or orangey yellow for me. And so again, um, I am going to make this a little smaller, Control or Command minus, because I want to use my Transform tool, and that's Control or Command T. And I, I, I want it kind of matching the book. The opacity is the best tool in the world. I can see through it so I can see exactly the angle I'm getting and I kind of want that angle. And I think I kind of want it there because I want it to appear on the paper, not so much everywhere else. Okay, I kind of like it like that. I'm going to commit to it by hitting enter. And it looks kind of weird right now, but this here, uh, and help me, these, this is your layer modes, right? That's the word, mode. Um, I made a mistake and called it a layer style a couple of weeks back. They're kind of called it's something like la layer blend modes. I think they call them blend modes. Yeah, it's a blend, that's right. It's a blend mode. That's what it is, exactly what it is. And I like this area in here. Um, I'll just show you. you. You can play around with them. Um, Overlay is one of my favorite. And it, and it, I don't want to try and get into the explanation. You can see what it did. Um, if I if I use things like lighten, it does that. If I use darken, it does that. But if I use these overlay modes, blend modes, it, it does more like that. There's a couple things I can play with. One is the opacity. And I'm going to kind of dial it in there. Uh, I think I'm just going to move it down a bit. And I'm going to do the same thing. While I'm highlighted here, I'm going to click on the mask icon, I call it a washing machine in the bottom here. Add layer mask. While it's highlighted, I'm going to paint with black. Right now, it, my color is white, so I'll use the X to switch. Choose my paintbrush and just paint around that area where I didn't want it to be applied. And that's that. Now I want to apply. I was going to apply. I'm not going to do it right now. Maybe I should. I just don't want to run out of time. I want to let Jan have her chance, and I want to do one thing in Lightroom. Um, let me just apply one more texture quickly. And are there any questions, Dave, about this? 
I love the way this is looking. It's such a great yeah. idea to apply a texture to the paper, and it's something I hadn't thought of at all. I think it looks great. And that's something I haven't done a lot of is is adding textures to, to things. I, I usually yeah. I haven't thought outside this the box I think was enough. Try, try to work with what I have rather than thinking, oh, I can enhance this with something else. I'm just waiting for my dialogue this time, unlike the last time. That's a cool texture. So that's going to load. So I, I, I can work. Texture blending is great if you're very subtle and you build layers. The more layers, more subtlety to the layers, the more elegant it seems to look. If you try and do it with just one or two layers, it tends to look a little cheaper, if, if, if that's the word to use. I don't know if you, even that's the word to use. But um, I'm going to open this one. I think what I want to do is leave it exactly the way it is. Uh, as far as colors and everything go, I'm just going to do the uh, move and bring it over into my image. I said I'm going to move and bring it over into my image. <laughs> I think what's wrong is it's just so much, these large 16-bit images are so difficult for the I have computer. a lot. Control T um, just to transform it so I can... Now, like I said, I'm not going to get into the advantages and disadvantages of smart objects. Um, one is destructive. I'm never going back to this. I'm not making enough of a, an image manipulation for me to... Um, whoops, I didn't want to do that exactly. And I'm going to commit to that by pressing Enter. And so for this, I don't have to be working in smart objects, but I really should be. Um, and I can can change it to a smart object if I want, but I'm just going to work straight layers and masks. That's all I'm concerned about today. Now, all I'm going to do with this right away is just go to my blend mode and see what it looks like in overlay. And then I can even drag it around a bit, move it, see if I want, because I knew there was kind of a blank spot in the middle there. Uh, I'm going to try and invert it by using Control i That's a, something I constantly do is just test mm. these with inverting them. But I think I'm going to leave it like that, dial back the opacity. No, I'm going to leave the opacity. I might even go with hard light. No, I won't go with hard light. It leaves too much white. Um, I'm going to leave it just like that. But this time, instead of painting all around, I, I want the texture around. I'm just going to paint out the middle. And the thought process in this is completely creative. There's no right way to do this. Um, you're watching me exercise a thought process here instead of a specific set of steps. So these are this isn't exactly how you do each step. Every step you do will be your own decision. How much, how little. It's considered a playground. And so to save on space, I'm going to merge this document together. I don't really need to get back to it as layers. So I'm just going to right click and ask it to merge visible. And so now I have a document that when I close, will go back to Lightroom. I just close it. I s click yes to saving it. And maybe you can answer this. Sometimes it does this and sometimes it doesn't, Jan. And it's only been happening the last three days. Normally it goes right to Lightroom without this dialog. Hmm. Today. We tried, you know, what I usually do is I just go file, save, and then I close it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I've never seen that box. I've never seen that box myself. Until three like, maybe days ago, just because I always hit file, save first. Until three days ago, I didn't see it myself either. So, so I, the, I important, the important point and the thing I've seen people do incorrectly here is after you go from photo, from Lightroom to Photoshop, make changes in Photoshop. When you do save, you do not want to save as. You just want to save because you don't want to change the name or the location or anything of the file you're saving. If you do it that way, then you will find your corrections from Photoshop showing up in a separate image back in Lightroom. Don't save as a separate image. Just save. So the question just, about the merging uh, yep. merging layers is there yeah. is there any practical difference between you know merge all layers and merge visible? Yes, um, there's one practical reason I know of, and Jen, you may know another. If you're working on a transparent layer, 
when you move it becomes white or or not transparent any longer whereas if you flatten or, or sorry if you flatten it becomes white like a, on a png if you flatten it becomes your transparent area becomes white or okay. opaque on a merge layer it, it, it maintains its transparency okay that's the only reason i know for a difference and you know i use use the merge visible for a really special purpose when i you know how you can only add a filter to one layer at a time in photoshop so let's mm -hmm. say that i have 10 layers in my photoshop file and i want to apply a um, i don't know a, a sharpening filter to all of them so then what i do is i go to the top layer i hold down the option key or the alt key on a pc and i choose merge visible and that will actually stamp a brand new layer at the top of the layer stack that contains all the layers beneath. And that is the one to which I apply a filter. Now, I okay. hope that made sense. It's a lot of, you know, when you're not watching, it's a lot to say. Yeah. But it's hard. it doesn't exactly answer your question, but that's a special. Well, that, that does. I mean, you're basically, you're combining all the layers below into one layer on top while still keeping the ones below. Yeah, you still maintain exactly. your stack, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to do two really quick things. One is... I'm going to go into effects and use this really quick way to create a dark vignette in, in Lightroom. It's in the effects panel and I'm just going to drag that to the left and it's going to create a bit of a darker vignette. I'll just show you the difference there because I want that moody, dark, mystery kind of look to it. And I'm just going to feather it a bit more so that it, oh, it's doing it to me now. Trust Lightroom. Now that I've had it open in Photoshop, it does this. And um, so I'm going to leave it like that for now. And I'll just show a before, after. There, before, after, before, after, just so we focus on the book. And the other thing this can be good for is if you want to apply text or create a special card or a great place to put a little kind of a note or a letter or an inspiration. Um, all kinds of things you can do with an image like this. But the, the one thing I do want to show you here in Lightroom is the ability to work on an individual channel. Um, here, for example, I can work on just a blue channel. And let's say I, I want to tone down the, the warmth in the shadows a bit. I want to cool them off. So I do that. But I want the book. See how the book is going whiter and whiter? Now it's off to blue. What I want to do is I still want the highlights and the midtones to stay the way they were. So I'm going to drag this end back down. So now my book is coming back as a bit warmer. It requires a little bit of playing. Oh, that's neat. So the dark areas of the book look blue, and the lighter areas still look, look kind of gold. Or, or less warm, yeah, more bluish or less warm. And, and yeah, oops, let me delete that one thing. Uh, it's not working for me here. I wanted to delete that one. But that's the click idea. There and anyway. just drag it off real hard. Like click on it and pull yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. It's kind of an alternate way of so, doing sort of a cross processing, I guess. It is. It is exactly. See, and then you can get pretty wild with it if you want. But I'm not doing that now. So that is an example where I can create that beautiful. Now it's starting to look more like a classic type of film image. And uh, there's one thing bothering me immensely about this image. And I'm just going to use my brush. Again, my flow is a bit lower. My feather's fairly high. So I'm using the adjustment brush. I'm using a moderate amount of feather, a low amount of flow, and I always work with 100% density. And I'm going to highlight a bit of spots of this book. It's driving me crazy. Whoops. Oh, I really like that. That makes a big difference. Except. Yeah. You know, while you're doing that, let me say that this business about um, working with one color channel at a time in Lightroom, I believe is something that is new in one of the updates to Lightroom 4. And so if you're using Photoshop 5 with Camera Raw 6 point something, I think if you took this image back to Photoshop, you would not see the changes you had made to the blue color channel. I'm guessing. So there's a challenge to those of you who are working on this image. If you still have Photoshop uh, 5 and the accompanying camera raw, but yet you have Lightroom 4, 
see if you see if the changes you make in Lightroom to individual channels show up when you take it back over into Photoshop. Hmm. Okay, now I'm just going to show you using um, our handy compare the before and after. And so there you have it. Now there's more I could do. There's a bit of contrast issue. There's more painting I can do, but I want to let Jen start working on the image. We're going to go a bit over tonight, but that's okay. I actually it's thought that would okay. be a lot faster. <laughs> well, so actually, I think here. the one you have on the right is the one that I corrected, I think. Oh, you're right. Sorry, Jen. Let me get rid of that. Let me... You're right. I think it's that one. There it is. Yep. There, before and after. And I would do more work on this to give it a little bit more depth. It's a little flat looking still. Um, and, and that would just come with contrast and, like I said, painting on it a bit because I'd lost some of the, the nice uh, contouring in the book, which I was just doing a second ago. But there, that's an example of creatively applying some techniques and layer masks with Photoshop. I like it. Very cool, Ron. Well, I really appreciate you doing that. And I think I love the way you cropped uh, the bottom part of the image out, which had that ugly looking light in it. Um, and I love the way you add the textures. What a great idea. Now I'm going to stop that, stop sharing that. And I will stop my screen share. Hey, Jan, I think you need to explain to everyone your flag. No, oh, my flag. We were just <laughs> playing around before, before the broadcast started with the um, the ability to add your lower thirds under each of our um, our names down here, our little photos down here at the bottom of the Google Plus um, screen share. And so, <laughs> I added the Israeli flag because my daughter is here visiting. She just came back from six month in six months in Israel, so that's why that's there. And Ron, of course, is from Canada, so he's got the Canadian flag. And you're our American, Dave. What yeah. about you, Taylor? You're muted. You're muted, Taylor. We can't hear what you're, you're saying, muted. Taylor. <laughs> Ron, did you mute her or did she mute herself? No, she's not muted on my end. I don't know oh. what happened. Oh, no. Oh, dear. Well, we can't hear what you're saying. We can't hear you, Taylor. Oh, no, you'll have to chat in the, the group chat. Taylor, go up to the top right of your Google Plus on-air window and click on that mute microphone button, maybe? No? Yikes. Maybe one of you guys can work with Taylor on that while I share my screen. How about that? It says Dave Bell muted Taylor. Well, I'm trying to mute her and unmute her. All um, right. Just trying something. So while you guys are futzing around with the mute, I am going to share my screen. Do you guys see it yet? I see me. <laughs> Do you see Lightroom there now? There we go, yes. Okay, cool. Um, so this is a photo that Ron Bell took, and it's a beautiful photo. It really is. Let me make it larger. Right now I'm in Lightroom's library module looking at the thumbnail of this photo. I, if I, I didn't know like Dave's brother there. That was pretty good. I like that. <laughs> If I select that photo and I press D on my keyboard like Dave or Dummy or Develop, that switches me over to the Develop module where I can Dave work and, on this Dave and Dummy? What was that? <laughs> not in that order or not at all related. <laughs> and I'm going to now press I on my uh, keyboard to get rid of the, the name of the image up there. And if you press a couple of times, that will cycle through different information about the image. So before I start working on this photo, which I think looks great as it came up here in my Lightroom, um, I'm just going to set up my screen. I like to collapse that column on the left by clicking the arrow at the far left. And I'm also going to do something with my panels over here on the right. Notice that if I open one panel, and then I open another panel, and I open another they all just start opening and we end up with this long, long column of information on the right. So I like to have just one panel open at a time. So I'm going to right click on the header of any of the panels and from the menu that appears I'm going to choose solo mode. 
I love solo mode. Now, if I click on any panel in the column on the right, all the others close and I only get one panel at a time. And that's way easier to work with. So there's a little tip for you. And I'm going to start working in the basic panel. So I'll click on the arrow to the right of basic and that opens only the basic panel this time. Now before I start working on any image in Lightroom, I love to look at the histogram. The histogram, you know, is a chart that describes what's happening with the tones in the image. And this histogram is telling me that this image has tones all the way across the tonal range, from bright brights to dark darks. So it's almost perfect to start with. There's, you know, I could just say, hey, we're done. <laughs> like, this is great. Thank you, Ron, for making such a, a nice image to start with. Makes my job easier. Hey, Jan, on the histogram on the left side, is that is the color of the arrow mean is just the blue channel that's cl clipped? Or the color of this arrow right of this triangle yes. up at the top left? Yes. That's a great question. So the triangle at the top left represents what's called a shadow clipping warning. And right now it is not activated. If I click on it, so it gets a white border around it, it becomes activated. And now if I were to make part of the photo way too dark, it would turn blue. Let me see if I can make that happen. Oh, okay. So that's like the that. color you want it to appear. Right, and that's just a warning saying, hey, you have just now turned all of those areas of the photo to pure black with no detail. And normally we like to have detail in the shadows as well as in the highlights. Now if I go back up and I click on that shadow clipping warning again, the blue marker goes away. And I'll take my blacks back to zero again. That's all that is. And there's a, a highlight clipping warning over here that would do the same thing if I select that and activate it and then I push the highlights so bright, oh, I can't even do it in this image. Maybe I can. There, I've made the highlight areas so bright that they're off the chart. They're now pushed to pure uh, white with no detail. And this red indicator means, hey, you better bring some uh, content back into those areas if you wish. And if I turn off the highlight clipping warnings, you don't even see that. Make sense? Yep. That's I guess I was wondering if, it, if you could tell if it was just a single channel that was clipping or if it's just any channel clipping. Oh, you're absolutely right. If the uh, highlight or shadow clipping triangles turn a particular color, that means that you are clipping the detail in one of the RGB color channels first, or perhaps CMYK, depending on your image. Um, and so if it's blue, that means that you're losing detail in the blue channel as opposed to all the channels at once. If it were white, that would mean all the channels. Okay. Okay, so anyway, so here I've got Ron's image. It's beautiful to start with. And what I normally do is I just start in the basic panel and I work my way down through the sliders. So oftentimes um, I'll find that, you know, images need a little bit of exposure boost. And the histogram is telling me as much. If I look at the histogram, I see that on the far right, I really don't have any tonal values way over to the right. So I'll take that exposure slider and I'm just going to drag it slightly. Now I'm very uh, conservative with the exposure slider. I, n I hardly ever go past a boost of maybe a third of a stop, at least if I'm working with an image that I know I've exposed approximately correctly in the camera. And then I'll go to the contrast slider. Now I think there's a lot of confusion about what contrast does. So keep your eye up there on the histogram. If I drag that contrast slider way over to the right, do you see that the color, the range of pixels is kind of moving out to the right and the left? And if I drag the contrast slider to the left, you see how that range of pixels is moving in toward the middle in the histogram. That's what contrast does. It just expands the tonal range as a whole or contracts it as a whole. And in many cases, I find that increasing the contrast by just a bit will make the image look a lot better without blocking up the shadows or blowing out the highlights. So that's what I'm going to do here. Just add a little bit of a contrast boost. Maybe even a little less than that. Just a bit. Now, let's see where we are by doing a before and after view. I use the keyboard <coughs> shortcut of pressing the, um, what do you call <coughs> it? The, uh, it's like Backslash. a diagonal. It's a left-facing diagonal on my keyboard. <laughs> that's the backslash. That's right, the backslash key. So that's where I started. That's where I am. And pressing that backslash key takes me to before and then to after. By the way, somebody is click clicking. I don't know who, whoever was just typing. I can hear yeah, it. Tyler, uh, Apparently Taylor's my mic microphone is, is, is working, working again. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm glad, Taylor, now? we can hear you again. I'm here. All right. So I'll mute myself when I'm typing. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to go <clears throat> down to the highlights. Now, 
look at the clouds in the sky. They are so beautiful. I would like to bring out more detail in those clouds. So a trick I often use is drag that highlight slider over to the left. And as I do, I start to see more detail in the clouds. So again, there's without the highlight slider to the left, and here's with it dragged to the left. Did you see a difference in the clouds? Yes. Another trick that I do to bring out highlights in the clouds is go right down to the clarity slider. I love clarity. Clarity is a way of increasing the midtone contrast. So if I were to drag clarity over, that brings out even more detail in those clouds. And now I'm going to take a look maybe at the shadow slider. I use the shadow slider to open up the shadows so that where the shadows are quite dark, as in this area back here, or maybe over in the dark areas of the trees, I can get more detail in the shadows by dragging the, high, the, shadow, slide, pardon me, the shadow slider to the right. And I'm going to do that now. All right, let's see where we are with the backslash key. That's where I started. That's where I am. I like the direction I'm going, but I'm not done yet. The next thing I want to do is try to brighten up the brightest parts of the photo, like this wonderful steam or fogginess that's coming off the lake. So I'm going to take the white slider, and I'm going to drag that to the right. And what that will do is take the very brightest parts of the photo and make them even brighter. Now it's kind of subtle. I had this really cranked up, and when my friend John saw how far I'd cranked it, like way over here, he said, no, that's too much. And I think he was right. I just want a little subtle increase in the highlights. And you know, this is all subjective. There is no right answer here. It's simply the way that I like to interpret the image. And I'm kind of going for a realistic look, not a HDR look. So again, I'll compare where I started with where I am. I'm still happy with the difference. And the way I keep the reason I keep doing the before and after is my eyes aren't fine-tuned enough to see the difference until I compare it to something. Do you guys have that problem ever? Definitely. Yeah. You know, this doesn't it's like it looks okay, but when I see how it looked to start with, I go, oh, wow. Looks way yeah. better now, right? Okay, and finally, I often add a little bit of black just to increase the contrast, give a little pop. So I'll drag the black slider over just a slight bit. Now I'm done with my basics. Um, I could go for maybe a little bit of saturation or vibrance. Yeah, it looks, I don't know, maybe I'll try increasing the saturation a bit. But one problem I have with the photo right now is that the clouds are very saturated, as are the red tree on the left, but the rest of it is not. So now I want to come in and start fine-tuning my adjustments. And I'm going to do that by going to another panel, the HSL color and black and white panel. I'll click that panel open. And here what I want to do is maybe bring out the oranges and the yellows because I see that there are some in the background over here and there's over on the left as well but they're very desaturated right now. So I could do an on image adjustment by clicking this on image tool and then coming in and clicking maybe on the yellows in these clouds or in these trees and dragging up and that increases the oranges and yellows. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to just drag the sliders to taste. Now keep in mind that the adjustments I'm making here are affecting not just the trees on the left, but everywhere that orange or yellow appears in the image, including in the cloud here and over here in the orange and yellows in these trees. So this is not like a local adjustment, but it is a more targeted adjustment in the sense that it only affects specific colors in the image. And you can play with those a little bit too. Another way to make more specific adjustments in Lightroom is to use the adjustment brush. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to get that adjustment brush here in the uh, column on the right. And I think what I'd like to do is try to pump up these trees a bit. So I'm going to increase the saturation. And I can fine tune this later. I'll pull it way over. I'll move into the image and I'll make my brush smaller by clicking the left bracket key on my keyboard. I want to make the brush small, just about the size of the, the background trees here. And I'm clicking and dragging over them. And if you, you can see, it's a very subtle change, but I am adding some saturation to just that area over which I'm dragging my brush. If you want to see that area, I can turn on this checkbox next to Show Selected Mask Overlay, and there is the actual area I'm affecting now. I'll uncheck that to get rid of that red mark. And if you want to see a before and after of just what I've done with that adjustment brush, at the bottom of the... Um, the brush panel here, 
I can click this toggle on and off. Do you see a difference there? Just where the trees are in the background. So good, I'm happy with that change. I'd like to add another adjustment brush to affect another part of the image, which is this beautiful fog here in the center. So in the, mat, in the brush panel that's now showing, I'll click the New button to make a brand new adjustment brush. Now this one, I'm not interested in saturation, so I'll double click the head on the saturation slider to send that back to zero. What I want to do with this brush is maybe increase the exposure. So I'm going to drag the exposure slider over. And again, I'm just guessing at an amount to start with. I can fine tune this later. And I'm going to click and drag over the fog. Notice how it's brightening up a bit so that we can see it better. What do you think of that? Is that something you might do, you guys? Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know, might try a little clarity addition to that brush. Because of course, you can add more than one type of adjustment to the same brush. Not I, too much. I just love about the brushes in Lightroom. It, I, I love the fact that you can dial it back after you painted it mm -hmm. as well so easily. You know, you make yeah. a very good point. So if I didn't like the exposure adjustment, I can get it back to zero by just dragging it. I could even make it darker. <laughs> I just want a little bit of an exposure adjustment. Not too much. Mm, maybe something like that because I want it to look realistic. If I want it to look more HDRE, I could increase the exposure, the contrast, the clarity, and the saturation perhaps. Um, now what, what am I going to do? Let me try a different kind of local adjustment, one that addresses just the water down here. I'm going to get my gradient uh, filter tool from the toolbar in Lightroom, graduated filter tool, pardon me, and what I'm going to do here is I want the water to be a little lighter and maybe a little more saturated. So I'm going to take my exposure, maybe I'll put it around, I don't know, around 30. I'm just guessing again because I can come in and change it later. And I'll increase my saturation a bit as well. And then I'm going to come down to the bottom of the image and click and drag up. And I'm creating a gradient of those two qualities, the increased exposure and increased saturation. And I can click on that pin that represents this gradient change and move it wherever I want it. As I move up, you can see that I'm moving the effect up. So it's affecting mostly the cloud here rather than the bottom of the image. I want that cloud to pop a little bit, so I'm happy with that change. Now I'm looking at the image and I'm going, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to crop away that bottom altogether. I don't think it really adds so much to this image. So I'll go up here and I'll click on the crop tool. With the crop tool locked down as it currently is, I'm going to come into the menu next to the lock and I'm going to choose to crop to the 16 by 9 aspect ratio. I often like to use this particular aspect ratio when I'm working with a really linear, horizontally linear image like the one that Ron had shot so nicely. And then I'll click inside of that crop box and I'll move to wherever I want the crop box to be. And you know that in Lightroom, you end up moving the image around in the crop box rather than moving the crop box itself. And sometimes if I want a better view of what I'm doing as I uh, set my crop, I'll press the L key on my keyboard and that uh, dims the lights. And if I press L again, it blacks out the lights. And now as I move that image around in the crop box, I can see the result without all that distracting Lightroom stuff around the edges. I could also move over any of the edges of my crop box and drag, you know, to fine tune. You can do all of this in lights out mode. I kind of like that. So I might go with something like this. And then to go back to see the controls in Lightroom, I'll press L and that gets me back. When I'm done with my crop, I'll click the crop tool again and that crops the image for me. Now remember, none of that information is gone. So if a month from now I come back in and click the Crop Overlay tool again, I can adjust my crop further. I might unlock that lock to get more control over each of the um, edges so that I can, I'm not stuck with the 16 by 9 ratio that I started with. I can kind of fine tune that a bit. Okay, and I'll click the Crop tool again. So now I'm pretty happy with this image. Um, it's a little bit after 8 o'clock, so Ron, is it okay with you if I go over time a little bit? Oh, yeah, by all means. 